Hello and welcome to Eccentric Earth, the podcast where I, your host Amy Walker, delve into stories from across history with a guest who has no idea what the topic's going to be. Joining us this week is Chris Haig. Hi. Hi, welcome back. I know, you can't, you honestly cannot get rid of me. I am like a boomerang or a bad penny <laughs> or that one aunt who always comes around just to check on you. Like a, uh, that's just my experience though. So. Well, we, we do like you and we, we seem to get good feedback about you in the very little feedback we get. So <laughs> I love that. We, we seem to get good feedback about you and I'm like, oh good. So they haven't gone, who is that gay dumpster fire that you have on every six episodes? Going like, eh, Mothman. Oh, come on. We love the Mothman. <laughs> and, well, I mean, the problem with this show, and it's not really a problem, but it is when you have such, and you can relate to us as someone who reads a lot, but like, I have a massive, and I genuinely mean massive, as in my desk is mostly books. I have a reading problem in the sense of there's too many books I want to read. I mm-hmm. know when you're enough time. So every time oh, I, yeah. every time I'm like, it was like today. On, I'm again, this is a total misnomer, but I regularly <laughs> have books coming in. I've got three coming in tomorrow, and I'm just looking now at the pile, and I'm like, oh, this isn't going to go down, is it? Because <laughs> as I read them, and I'm a fairly quick reader, I just add more. It's like on Friday, I'm going to Waterstones after work. I'm like, I'm going to add more, aren't I? Even when I say I'm just going to look. I know exactly how it is. I, I'm in a worse situation. I manage a charity shop. Oh. The amount of books oh. that come in. I have brought boxes and boxes of books. <laughs> we had to turn the dining room into a library just to keep up with me, and I'm already overflowing again. Oh. <laughs> That's my thing. I mean, I'm moving out because I live with my family at the moment, but I am going to move out in the summer. And I'm like, oh, if I found that maybe it will be a spare room so I can have guests over. And I, I already know it's like, no, no, it's just going to be a library. It's just yeah. it's just going to be that. <laughs> and then maybe I'll stick a bed in the middle of it so that maybe if guests go over, or maybe if I just want to have a nap in the reading room, <laughs> like I'm a 17th century like top, I'm like, oh, yes, of course there's going to be a day bed in the reading room. <laughs> you know what? You should combine the two and... When people walk in, they go, oh, that's a lovely big bed. It's like, yeah, it's actually just a pile of books with a sheet on it. You best not lay on it. Yeah. So it looks the part, but you can't really use it. So like I structure it so well and try and create like a headboard as well. Yeah. Out of smaller <laughs> books. Like the big, like the flat ones at the bottom are just like the big, like art picture books. And then it slowly makes its way up. And it's just like, well, you can try laying on it, but I'm not going to guarantee that if you lay on it, you will either be in amazing amount of pain <laughs> Or that if you do anything so much as like, you know, kind of sneeze, cough off fat during the night, that you won't just kind of destroy the bed <laughs> and just take down like an entire like, you know, oh, there goes all the murder mysteries. Why? Because you just fell through the middle of them and she just, you know. <sighs> oh. Remember Sorry. how five minutes ago before we started, we said there's going to be huge tangents. <laughs> we talked for like a full 20, 25 minutes. And then, and it's it is it is obviously my fault. I do not, I physically cannot help it. It's this is what I'm like at work. I just talk, <laughs> and people go, "What do you mean?" And I'm like, "Oh, this way." I'm like a witch in the woods. I'm like, "This way, this way down down the dark path I'm leading you." You know, it's yeah, it's it's a curse and a curse. <laughs> oh well, we'll try and. Stay on topic if we can. Tonight, I was going to say, I was gonna say you, have, you have promised me that this one is uh, a short and sweet one, which hopefully will minimise the amount of like uh, chat I can shit or yeah, second well, chat. I, I've sort of developed a system for yourself where it's like you know aim for about half hours worth of content, and with the tangents you get about an hour and a half's episode worth, so it should work <laughs> out fine. <laughs> It's like a one-to-one ratio of actual content, <laughs> and then Chris is just bollocks. <laughs> My God. Okay, this is a lot of untruth tonight. <laughs> oh God. Okay. All right. 
Well, shall we? Uh, yeah. Shall we go into the story and see how long we can spin it out for? Yeah, yeah. Because uh, <laughs> because I'll be honest, I'm laughing that hard that uh, if we don't get through it fairly quickly, I'm going to pee myself. This podcast is part of Brit Pod Scene, an independent network of uniquely British podcasts that's always growing. Check out BritPodScene.com or BritPodScene on Twitter to find out more. Althea Gibson was born on the 25th of August 1927 in the town of Silver in Clarendon County, South Carolina. She was born to African-American parents Daniel and Annie Gibson, who worked as sharecroppers on a cotton farm. Two years after Althea's birth, America was hit with the Wall Street crash and the Great Depression began. The Great Depression hit rural southern farmers such as the Gibsons sooner than much of the rest of the country, and as such they made the choice to move to Harlem in 1930, where Althea's three sisters and brother were later born. They lived in an apartment located on a stretch of 143rd Street that had been designated a Police Athletic League play area. This meant that during daylight hours it was barricaded so that neighbourhood children could play organised sports in the street. Althea expressed an early interest in sports and quickly became proficient in paddle tennis, and by 1939, at the age of 12, she was the New York City women's paddle tennis champion. Aww. Yeah. 12? Okay. For the whole city, and New York, that's a big group of people. (laughs) Paddle, what is paddle tennis? Is it like ping pong? I knew I should have looked something up before I started. (laughs) There's always one question. Let's have a look. Paddle tennis? Uh, no, it's full full tennis. Okay. Um, it looks like the the rackets are smaller, much smaller. Um, oh. I will show you in Skype for those listening. If you search paddle tennis, you'll see that it's played on not exactly full size courts. They are smaller courts from the look of it, so and it, the rackets are smaller. So it's like proper tennis, but for children. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, well, the pictures I'm seeing are with adults, so I don't know how insulting that is, oh. but it might be. <laughs> so it's like, it's for tennis for people who just, like, don't have the strength in their wrists or something. Sorry, it that's not like demeaning. I wasn't, like, generally, if you, like, if you don't have strength in your wrist, then cool, that's fine. I just don't. From understand. the look of the side of the court, it's kind of like, I get the impression of, you know, five-a-side football, where it's like, we'll play football, but smaller version. It seems to be kind of like that. We'll play tennis, but condensed. Easier. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I listen, <laughs> Saying know. easier, I couldn't be the paddle tennis champion, so... No, no, <laughs> no. None, I, I don't think many of us could, so that's fair. So in 1940, a group of her neighbours took up a collection to finance a junior membership and lessons at the Cosmopolitan Tennis Club in the Sugar Hill section of Harlem for Althea, allowing her to gain access to further training and better resources. In 1941, Althea entered and won her first tournament, the American Tennis Association New York State Championship. She won the ATA National Championship in the girls' division in 1944 and 1945, and after losing in the women's final in 1946, she won her first 10 straight national ATA women's titles wow. in 1947. Bloody hell! Who is yeah. this girl? I've never heard of her. If you're saying bloody hell, who is she at this point? You wait. This is tip of the iceberg. Oh, okay. She said, I knew that I was an unusual, talented girl through the grace of God. I didn't need to prove that to myself. I only wanted to prove it to my opponents. Her ATA success drew the attention of Walter Johnson, a Lynchburg, Virginia physician who was active in the African-American tennis community. Under his patronage, Althea gained access to more advanced instruction and more important competitions, and later to the United States Lawn Tennis Association. In 1946, she moved to Wilmington, North Carolina, under the sponsorship of another physician and tennis activist, Herbert A. Eaton, and was enrolled in the racially segregated Williston Industrial High School. In 1949, she became the first black woman and the second black athlete after Reginald Weir to play in the USTA's National Indoor Championships, where she reached the quarterfinals. Later that year, she entered the Florida A&M University on a full athletic scholarship. Despite her growing reputation as an elite level player, Althea was barred from entering the premier American tournament, the United States National Championship, 
which would go on to become the US Open. Whilst the USTA rules officially prohibited racial or ethnic discrimination, players qualified for the Nationals by accumulating points at sanctioned tournaments. These tournaments were mostly held at white-only clubs, and as such, Althea was prevented from playing. Uh, Yay, racism. Uh, you think you can have such a nice day and then you remember that segregation <laughs> was still a thing. Lovely. Yeah. And it's insane. Yeah. The the time scale, I, I still find it shocking that the first black student to go to a non-segregated school in the US is in her 60s. Yeah. It's like, uh, that, that shouldn't... That that time frame just messes my head. It's like, that's fucked up. Yeah. Do better, well, America. I know. <laughs> well, thank God racism solved. Oh, oh yeah, that, that one was sorted I know. years ago. Oh, thank... <laughs> can, you, can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> Ugh. Yeah. No, yeah, of course. <laughs> Sorry, I can't, I can't be gloom. Like, I'll make a joke, but like, oh, God, isn't it such a fucking nightmare? Yeah. yeah. Good old white people. Yeah, white people, we're there. Oh, I just closed that window. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, right, where was I on the script? Yeah, it just went. <laughs> where, where, where was I? I have just closed it. Right. That's a test That's a test of how much you research, Jamie. Do it without scripts. <laughs> uh, do it without scripts. Um, she died at the end. I, I know that she was born and died. The middle bit's hazy. I think that's pretty much all human life, really, isn't it? <laughs> they look okay, at yeah, that's... the middle bit was a bit hazy. I think you've solved the podcast. We're yeah. done now. You, know? <laughs> you can find me on Twitter. At... <laughs> I've solved the podcast. <laughs> You're like, eccentric Earth. Oh, it's not that eccentric, really, isn't it? Well, it's been fun <laughs> doing this with you over the past... <laughs> Like yeah. year or so? I can't remember when we first started doing this. Yeah, Sorry. I, I would invite you on again, but you've ended the show, so <laughs> I'm like I'm like, I wasn't the first guest, but I'll be the last. <laughs> That's almost a bit threatening, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even mean it that way. But fair, fair, all right. It's pretty like Oh, is that a threat? And it's like No. <laughs> In nineteen fifty in response to intense lobbying by the ATA officials and retired champion Alice Marble, who published a scathing open letter in the magazine American Lawn Tennis, Althea became the first black player to receive an invitation to the Nationals. She made her debut at Forest Hills on her 23rd birthday. Ah. Although she lost by a narrow margin in the second round in a rain-delayed three-set match to Lewis Bruff, the reigning Wimbledon champion and former U.S. national winner, her participation received extensive national and international coverage. A quote from the journalist Lester Rodney says, No Negro player, man or woman, has ever set foot on one of these courts. In many ways, it is an even tougher personal Jim Crow busting assignment than was Jackie Robinson when he first stepped out into the Brooklyn Dodgers dugout. In 1951, Althea won her first international title, the Caribbean Championship in Jamaica, and later that year became the first black competitor at Wimbledon, where she was defeated in the third round by Beverly Baker. By 1952, she was ranked seventh nationally by the USTA, and in the spring of 1953, she graduated from Florida University and took a job teaching physical education at Lincoln University in Jefferson City, Missouri. During her two years at Lincoln, she became romantically involved with an army officer who she never publicly named, and during this time she considered enlisting in the Women's Army Corps. However, she decided against it when the State Department sent her on a goodwill tour of Asia in 1955 to play exhibition matches. Many Asians in the countries they visited, such as Burma, India and Thailand, quote, felt an affinity to Althea as a woman of colour, and were delighted to see her as part of the official U.S. delegation. With the United States grappling over the question of race, they turned to Althea for, advan for answers, or at least to get a first-hand perspective. Althea strengthened her confidence immeasurably during the six-week tour, and when it came to a close, she remained abroad, 
and going on to win 16 of 18 tournaments in Europe and Asia against many of the world's best players. Okay, that is awesome. Yeah. Good for, good for her. Yeah, she's just going from strength to strength. She's yeah. an amazing player. Well, not just that, but also this kind of great cultural ambassador as well. Yeah. yeah. And especially at this time as well. It's. I say you said like 50, 55? So that's, wow. This is like really close to the birth of what would become the civil rights movement as well. Like yeah. It's the same yeah. year that uh, Rosa Parks did the bus. <coughs> oh, really? Uh, refused to oh, move wow. on the bus and it led to the Montgomery bus boycott, which then led to the civil rights movement. So, yeah, racial tensions in America are extremely high at this point. So, yeah, she's she's doing amazing to be doing this at that time and at that age as well. Okay. In 1956, Althea became the first African-American athlete to win a, glance, a Grand Slam tournament, the French Championship singles event. She also won the doubles title, partnered with Britain Angela Buxton, and later in the season she won the Wimbledon, double, the Wimbledon doubles championship again with Buxton, the Italian championships in Rome, the Indian championships in New Delhi, and the Asian, and the Asian championships in Ceylon. She also received the quarterfinals in singles at Wimbledon and the finals at the US Nationals, losing both to Shirley Fry. Oh. But still, she's getting more championships. I know, I know. <laughs> but it was just kind of like, she's doing, and the, oh, okay. <laughs> like, Shirley Fry, fine, but you know. The 1957 season, which in her own words were the Althea Gibson's year, in July, she was seeded first at Wimbledon considered at the time the World Championship of Tennis, and won the title after a victory in the finals against Darlene Hand. She was the first black champion in the tournament's 80-year history, and the first champion to receive the trophy personally from Queen Elizabeth II. Ah, oh my god, that does put into perspective. Wow. She said, Shaking hands with the Queen of England was a long way from being forced to sit in the coloured section of the bus. Mm. She also won the doubles championship that year for the second time. Upon her return to America, Althea became the only the second black American, after Jesse Owens, to be honoured with a ticker tape parade in New York City. And Mayor Robert F. Wagner Jr. presented her with the bronze medallion, the city's highest civilian award. A month later, she defeated Louise Bruff, the woman who beat her on her first match, in straight sets to win her first U.S. national championship. She said, Winning Wimbledon was wonderful, and it means a lot to me, but there is nothing quite like winning the championship of your own country. In all, she reached the finals of eight Grand Slam events in 1957, winning the Wimbledon and U.S. national singles titles, and the Wimbledon and Australian doubles championships, as well as the U.S. The US mixed doubles crown, and finishing second in Australian singles, US doubles, and Wimbledon mixed doubles. At the season's end, she broke yet another barrier as the first black player on the US Whiteman's Cup team, which defeated Great Britain 6-1. I mean, <coughs> I mean, less happy that she defeated the UK, but Christ, what a year. <laughs> she you don't wasn't even be, kidding you, when she said it was her year. <laughs> you don't even begrudge her, you know. You're just like, yeah, no, that was, that was, that was your year. Yeah. Oh, wow. Fair. Tough to argue with her calling it her year. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit like em when Emily Sander had 2012. I know it's not a thing at all. And the other difference is because I was thinking, like, who's another talented, you know, black, um, not performer in the sense of, you know, Althea Gibson was a performer. But I was just thinking, I was like, bloody hell, I just remember thinking 2012. Like, Emily Sander is everywhere. Like, they couldn't drag her off the stage at the Olympics. <laughs> Maybe that was it. Maybe I just thought Olympic sport and then just, yeah. Anyway, but no, good on Althea Gibson. I hope it isn't downhill from here. <laughs> I'm going to say, if it turns out to be, oh, and then she died, and I'll be like, bloody hell. Well, she I might mean, still be alive. It's possible, but... Well, no, because <laughs> because you, you just said, oh, and then she died, and it got a full seat <laughs> in the middle. So I'm probably going to guess she's dead, Amy. Um, otherwise, I might have heard of her, but who knows? Who knows? In 1958, Althea successfully defended her Wimbledon and US national single titles and won her third straight Wimbledon doubles championship. She was the number one ranked woman in the world 
and in the United States in both 1957 and 1958, and was named Female Athlete of the Year by the Associated Press in both years, garnering over 80% of the votes in 1958. She became the first black woman to appear on the covers of Sports Illustrated and Time magazine. Nice. Mm Mm-hmm. And at this point, I'm thinking, how have I not heard of her? Yeah. (laughs) I'll be honest. Given the fact that Serena Williams is the greatest living athlete, um, or, you know, the greatest athlete of all time and everything, and I'm like, I swear we would have heard something if it was like a precursor, because I'm sure in terms of tennis and everything, like, Billie Jean King did a lot. And, you know, she was one of the first openly gay tennis players, and that's fabulous and good for her. But, and this is a big but, they, they always reference, you know, oh, my inspiration was Billie Jean King, and there was always, you know, some great tennis players, you know, saying, oh, well, she's this and oh, she's that, that sort of thing. Like Navratilova, although she can go in the fucking bin. <laughs> could never at love of being you know saying like oh well you know trans trans women are faking it i'm like wow you could just go ahead and just fuck off yep straight about sorry there was a bbc article today and i got quite, i got quite mad at it because <laughs> it was it was like her there was dame kelly holmes that one stung the most Oof. i liked dame kelly holmes I, I have to say a full name that's how mad i am you know i was like she still has time to redeem herself maybe but then friggin paula bradcliffe when she was like oh well i just don't think it's fair and i'm like i'll oh, just fucking do one and have a shit in the street again <laughs> you're like oh it'll t- it'll, t- it'll taint her legacy and i'm like listen i already know enough about a taint <laughs> from when she from when she, you know she fucking jiggled a shite out in the middle of a marathon <laughs> I don't think she can really talk to anyone about, oh, it's not fair, it's not that sort of thing. Well, I'll tell you what, I don't think I'd, I've never seen a tra- There's never been, to my knowledge, a trans woman athlete who's ever gone, you know what, I'm so desperate for a piss or for a shit that I'm just going to crack one out on the pavement here. Bloody hell. I just, yeah. And then I had a cup of tea and I was quite fine with it. But I just got, I just got, I just got mad because it's all that kind of like, oh, well, they're cheating or... Uh, Martin, I can't remember which one of them said it. Oh, that was—I think it was Paula Radcliffe who. And I have to say this really carefully because I'm—I'm I'm colleagues with someone who's lovely, but her name's very similar, so I have to be really careful. Um, yeah, Paula Radcliffe, who was like, "Oh, they're biologically, um, you know, oh, how can you compete with someone who's biologically a, a man?" And I'm like, "Oh, you dick! It's not that." I, 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 and I just got mad, and I just yeah, yeah. And it's quite ironic, really. This is I didn't realise we were talking about tennis tonight. I was like, ah, oh, you know. It's there. worked out well. <laughs> it's it's worked out well, you know. And as I, you know, as, as I, I believe I've said it at least once, but I'm, I sign off, I'm like, oh, follow my Twitter, fuck turfs, you know. <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Um, Yeah. See, you were saying about, you know, Althea doesn't seem to get mentioned as an inspiration. Yeah. Um I I know I mention the Williams sisters later on. Yeah. I think as a comparison for like a gap between Althea doing something and them doing it, but I can't remember if I included it or not. They did actually write to her oh, before one so of their big events and like so they, they knew who she was and oh, respected yeah, yeah. her and everything. So I don't know if they've ever publicly mentioned her, but like Yeah. They know of her and respect her legacy, and well, like, which is I, nice. Yeah, no, no, I can absolutely imagine. You know that. Oh, yeah, they were. You know, they. It's kind of like a legacy thing, and you know, they that she paved the way for them and all that sort of thing, which is great. But like, as as with all these things, I'm like, where's the film about it? Where's yeah. the? You know, there's so many. Oh my god, there was that Battle of the Sexes film with Emma Stone. Who, I like Emma Stone, but she's on probation. You know. Yeah. Yeah, ever since she pretended to be Asian for a bit. It's like, <laughs> you're not the Emma. You're like the whitest woman I've ever seen. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I like her, um, but like, chill out, Emma. Um, you know, we have that Battle of the Sexes film. We've had, I can't, I honestly cannot think of another tennis film we've had, apart from Wimbledon, which that's not a documentary. That no. is a that is a rom-com with Paul Bettany and Kristen Dunst, and it's sort <laughs> of okay. But like, not really. Um, so yeah, well, I would, I would, I would watch this. I would, you know. 
Well, this story does involve more than just tennis. Oh. Yeah. Okay, well, we best get back to it then. <laughs> oh, okay, I've just spotted something in this paragraph, which I was talking about. It would be 15 years before another woman of colour, Yvonne Goulagon, in 1971, won a Grand Slam championship, and 43 years before another African-American woman, Serena Williams, won her first of six U.S. Opens in 1999. Uh, I mean, uh, okay. So, 43 years between Althea and Serena doing it. I just, yeah, I'm just, uh, oh, I just kind of wish it had been short. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, maybe we should have promoted, like... Tennis to more group rather than oh look you're you're a you know a middle class white girl have you tried tennis? It's like, Come here, whitey. Try whitey sport number one. Number two is cricket. <laughs> it's like how can you tell it's a white sport? Well, if they if you have to wear all white to it, <laughs> usually it's a pretty good bloody indicator. You know, tennis, cricket, fencing. <gasps> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm really surprised that like Boris Johnson, who is on a bit of a fucking roll recently with you know a- inappropriate comments, wasn't just like, oh yes, I don't see why more black people aren't into fencing and they're making some weird knife related <laughs> thing. It's like, oh yes, they knew how to go to stab it. You're just like, oh my god, how do give you it time. Still... <laughs> oh, I-, I know, I know. I mean, before and this is like a rant about the government, and I'm sorry, not sorry about this, but I was once convinced that Theresa May was secretly plotting to fuck over Boris Johnson by putting him in, in a position where he's most likely to kind of do the political equivalent of immolating himself, becoming like a <laughs> Roman candle. Just kind of saying like, oh, yeah, you, you, you Johnny Foreigner, that sort of thing. And then she'd have to go, I'm really sorry, you're going to have to resign now. And just yeah. like, fuck him over. But now I think he's basically untouchable because they think he's just a buffoon. And like, no, 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 no. no. He knows exactly what he's saying. So, like, don't do that. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Sorry, rant over. Fuck Brexit. <laughs> no. uh. In late 1958, having won 56 national and international singles and doubles titles, Althea retired from amateur tennis. Because I think up to now, she's only been playing it as an amateur. How? Can... Wait, she won Wimbledon, though. How could it be an amateur? Oh, I did Wimbledon, but this is only part-time. Yeah. It'll, it'll explain it in a little bit. Prior okay. to the Open era, there was no prize money at major tournaments, and direct endorsement deals were prohibited. Players were limited to small expense allowances, strictly regulated by the USTA. She said, In truth, to put it bluntly, it was my finances were in heartbreaking shape. Being the queen of all tennis is well and good, but you can't eat a crown, nor can you send the International Revenue Service a throne clipped into their tax forms. The landlord and grocer and tax collector are funny that way. They like cold cash. I reign over an empty bank account, and I'm not going to fill it by playing amateur tennis. Professional tours for women were still 15 years away, so her opportunities were largely limited to promotional events. So women just couldn't make money doing tennis yeah. at this point. Which, and this is 58, 15 years away, so mid-70s is when they started getting money for doing it. Oh, oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. At least in the US. Maybe different worldwide, but that's it's at least US. <clears throat> in 1959, she signed to play a series of exhibition matches against Carol Fager- Fageros. Vagaris, um, someone else, before Harlem Globetrotter basketball games. So you go to see the Harlem Globetrotters and you get to see the world tennis champion play as a (laughs) warm-up. I mean, oh, God. I'm not surprised. The saddest thing is I'm not surprised. I'm just like, of course, of course that happened. Yep. Yep. When the tour ended, she won the singles and doubles title at the Pepsi-Cola World Pro Tennis Championships in Cleveland, but received only $500 in prize money, the equivalent to just over (sighs) 4000 During this period, Althea also pursued her long-held aspirations in the entertainment industry. A talented singer and saxophone player, and runner-up in the Apollo Theatre's Amateur Talent Contest in 1943, 
she made her professional singing debut at W.C. Handy's 84th birthday tribute at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in 1957. An executive from Dot Records was impressed with her performance and signed her to record an album. Althea Gibson Sings was released in 1959, and Althea performed two of its songs on The Ed Sullivan Show in May and July of that year. I will be honest, this mm-hmm. is not the twist I saw coming. <laughs> when you said, oh, it's not just tennis, I was like, what What other kind of sport? It, like badminton? Is it like... <laughs> and then you're just like, no... No, no. She's a singer. <laughs> She's a singer too, which, like, don't get me wrong, like, great, good, go for it. But, like, ha, huh, not. Yeah. <laughs> I've gone for. So, fair enough. Power to you. If you can be, if you can be like a polymath, you can do wonderful things that are a lot of different things, which is, you know, very enviable, then good for you. Unfortunately, the album sales were disappointing and her career did not go any further. Oh. However, she also appeared as a celebrity guest on the TV panel show What's My Line, and was cast as a slave woman in the John Ford motion picture The Horse Soldiers in 1959. Oh, Christ. Her appearance in the film was noteworthy, due in large part to her refusal to speak in a, quote, stereotypic Negro accent, which was required by both the script and director. Good for her. Yeah. So she was like, nope, not doing that shit. I mean, don't get <laughs> me wrong. I mean, it's still a shame that she's like, oh, yes, she is playing a slave, but at least she's not, like, at least she's having some control and she's yeah. not talking the, you know, fair enough. <sighs> she also worked as a sports commentator, appearing in print and television advertisements for various products and increased her involvement in social issues and community activities. In 1960, her first memoir, I Always Wanted to Be Somebody, written with sports writer Ed Fitzgerald, was published. Her professional tennis career, however, was going nowhere. When I looked around me, I saw white tennis players, some of whom I had thrashed on the court, were picking up offers and invitations. Suddenly it dawned on me that my triumphs had not destroyed the racial barriers once and for all, as I had perhaps naively hoped, or if I did destroy them, they had been erected behind me again. In 1964, at the age of 37, Althea became the first African-American woman to join the Ladies Professional Golf Association Tour. There you go, there's your second sport. <laughs> ah, fair enough. I mean, go- yeah. I mean, I'll be honest, golf has kind of joined it for me, In and I, you know, please don't come at me, tennis and golf fans. It's one of those summer sports that I just don't care for. Like, tennis is fine, but the way that people talk about it, like Wimbledon, it's like Wimbledon's on for like two weeks. And it's all that some people can talk about. And it's just yeah. like, oh, just scores. I'm like, I know. Do not care. <laughs> just I just like, suddenly realised this is the second sporty person I've got you on for. Yeah. And it covers three sports and all of them be like, nah, I don't like them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, listen, it's fine, because at least that way I can kind of be objective and not be like, oh my god, that's such a legend, and it's like, don't get me wrong, I like people from each respective sport, but (laughs) I think you would have to pay me a substantial amount of money to sit and either watch a game or comment on a game or have anything really to do with a game that isn't cut from going like, well, Serena Williams seems nice, or, you know... Robin Friday, that was that was something. Which, which, <laughs> if this is your first time listening to the, to the to the show, check out the Robin Friday episode. If not for me, just for the how fucking wild it is. <laughs> yeah. The man so much of us live as he just sort of blazed. <laughs> it was weird. It's kind of it, it's the role that Tom Hardy should have been playing in three films back to back for the past ten years. <laughs> it's just. So much, all at once. Um, but yeah, definitely check that one out. Sorry, I'm, I'm plugging your show mid No, go for it. <laughs> and they're like, and here's the one that I liked. Um, no, so, I, stop, so stop listening to this. I do push that I do push that episode on certain people and just be like, it's some of the most fun we've ever had on the show because oh, it is. the story is just batshit crazy. Mm. And if you're into football, you're like, wow, this guy is an amazing sportsman and it, his achievements were great. 
And if you're not, you're thinking, this guy was fucking nuts. Yeah. How is this real? You're so like, it's good you're for like, everyone. <laughs> what do you mean he only died at like 38? I thought he would have <laughs> died much sooner. And you're like, what? And but then also, miss- how did he only die at 38? We've been at this for three hours. Yeah. Oh, it was... <laughs> he it, packed it, it in. <laughs> it, was, it, it, it was a long one. It was, it was a long episode. I got cramp in my legs. I was there going like, what, what was he doing? What was he doing? You're like, you're all right? And I'm like... I'm fine. And then I just having to fall back and go, right, okay, yep, here we go, that sort of thing. You know, I told my dad uh, the next day in the car, we were taking the dog somewhere, and I, he was just like, oh, so how did the recording go last night? I went, mm-hmm, good, good. So it's that history podcast. I went, yeah, yeah, the, uh, you know, the kind of like the mystery box history show. Um, and he said, who's you on? I went, have you ever heard of Robin Friday? And he said, no. And I'm like, cool. So we're driving for the next 40 minutes, and I just tell him everything I remember. <laughs> and my dad's reaction to all of this is going, that's bollocks. No, he didn't. And I'm like, oh, he did. <laughs> oh. Oh, 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 yes, he did. This is real. So we're like, what a tiger? And I'm like, uh-huh. <laughs> what do you mean he stole a swan? I'm like, he stole a swan, Dad. A real, a real swan. Yep. And then, so what happened with it? Yeah, he made him put the headstone back, so it's fine. <laughs> um, you know, on my favourite, which is when uh, the story about how he got, like, basically, he basically got skewered and somehow survived. It going through, like, his bum and through his spine or through his fucking... I don't know. They basically shish kebab the man, which makes me think that God just saw what was going to happen and was like, it's probably best if he just goes now, because it's too weird. But then he just bloke. pulled himself off the spike. Yeah. <laughs> and, at that, and at that moment in heaven, God was like, I have created something too powerful here. <laughs> I've created someone who is, you know, I'm sure was nice to know, but he was sort of like too thick and too proud to die and it was like oh okay <laughs> and my dad just refused to believe it and so i had to and it's weird it got into if you know anything about psychology you might know someone called phineas gage and it was a <laughs> whole thing and i had to explain i'm like no you yeah you could and he's like it didn't go through the brain though but this is the closest brain example um so yeah it was it was a whole thing so yeah um <laughs> check out the robin friday episode after you've checked this one out because you will listen, and aside from my 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 most used thing is that it's just going what? <laughs> I'm just going no, and you're going yes, and I'm like no, and you're like yeah, and I'm like what? And it's just it's a whole thing, um, but it is a wild, 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 wild episode, and he lived such a life, and I can't believe that no one has turned it into... I'm surprised Guy Ritchie hasn't turned it into a film. <laughs> you know. He's probably like the rest of us and just never have heard of the guy. <laughs> well, maybe, but you'd have thought, like, Guy Ritchie or frigging, like, Matthew Vaughn or somebody would have been like, hang on, so there's someone who's as outlandish as the characters that we create, but he was real. So we could frame this as a biopic and get, like, Tom Hardy or, you know, Fassbender involved or something. You're just like, yeah, just do it. Just do it. Uh, Back to Althea. <laughs> I, know, I know. What's worse is I looked at the time and went, we've been recording for 40 minutes. <laughs> so she's started playing golf. All right. <laughs> Sorry, um, it's just the way you said it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I feel like you're just like, well, oh, she so, started playing golf. <laughs> so she's, she's doing golf. Um, unfortunately, racial discrimination continued to be a problem for her. Mm. And many hotels still excluded people of colour, and country club officials throughout the South and some in the North routinely refused to allow her to compete. When she did compete, she was often forced to dress for tournaments in her car because she was banned from the clubhouse. This is... Yeah. 64. Yay. Mm. Although she was one of the LPGA's top 50 money winners for five years and won a car at the Dinah Shaw tournament, her lifetime golf earnings never exceeded £25,000. She made financial ends meet with various sponsorship deals and the support of her husband, William Darbden, brother of best friend and fellow tennis player Rosemary Darbden, who, was mar- who she married in 1965 although she would go on to divorce him in 76. While she broke course records during her individual rounds in several tournaments, 
Althea's highest ranking was 27th in 1966, and her best tournament finish was a tie for second after a three-way playoff in 1970. She retired from professional golf at the end of the 1978 season. Judy Rankin said, Althea might have been a real player of consequence had she started when she was young. She came along during a difficult time in golf, gained the support of a lot of people, and quietly made a difference. Good for her. Yeah. So even if she's not excelling in golf, she's still doing good. Still pushing those boundaries. Yes. In 1972, she began running Pepsi Cola's National Mobile Tennis Project, which brought portable sorry, which brought portable nets and other equipment to underprivileged areas in major cities. She ran multiple other clinics and tennis outreach programs over the next three decades, and coached numerous rising competitors, including Leslie Allen and Zena Garrison. She pushed me she pushed me as if I were a pro, not a junior, wrote Garrison in her 2001 memoir. I owe the opportunity I received to her. In 1976, Althea made it to the finals of the ABC television program Superstars, finishing first in basketball shooting and bowling, and runner-up in softball throwing. With the advent of the Open Era, she began entering major tennis tournaments again, but by then, in her 40s, she was unable to compete effectively against younger players. In the early 1970s, Althea began directing women's sports and recreation for the Essex County Parks Commission in New Jersey, and in 1976 she was appointed New Jersey's Athletic Commissioner, the first woman in the county to hold such a role. However, she resigned after one year due to lack of autonomy, budgetary oversight, and adequate funding. (sighs) She said, I do not wish to be a figurehead. In a 1977 historical analysis of women in sport, the New York Times columnist William C. Roden wrote, Althea Gibson and Wilma Rudolph are without question the most significant athletic forces among black women in sports history. While Rudolph's accomplishments brought more visibility to women as athletes, Althea's accomplishments were more revolutionary because of the psychological impact on black America. Even to those blacks who hadn't the slightest idea of where or what Wimbledon was, her victory, like Jackie Robinson's in baseball and Jack Johnson's in boxing, proved again that blacks, when given the opportunity, could compete at any level in American society. Also, in 1977, she challenged incumbent Essex County State Senator Frank J. Dodd in the Democratic primary for his seat. She came in second behind Dodd, but ahead of Assemblyman Eldridge Hawkins. Despite losing the election, Althea went on to manage the Department of Recreation in East Orange, New Jersey, and also served on the State Athletic Control Board, and became a supervisor of the Governor's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports. In 1983, she married Sidney Llewellyn, her coach during her peak tennis years. The marriage would also end in divorce five years later. In 1980, Althea became one of the first six inductees into the International Women's Sports Hall of Fame, alongside Amelia Earhart, Wilma Rudolph, Gertrude Ederl, Babe Didrikson Zaharias, I'm butchering these names, and Patty Berg. Other inductions included the National Lawn Tennis Hall of Fame, the International Tennis Hall of Fame, the Florida Sports Hall of Fame, the Black Athletes Hall of Fame, the Sports Hall of Fame of New Jersey, the New Jersey Hall of Fame, the International Scholar Athlete Hall of Fame, and the National Women's Hall of Fame. She received a Candence Award for the National Coalition of 100 Black Women in 1988. So that's a lot of accolades. I I was like, oh, she's going to fit. Nope. Okay. Yep. (laughs) I mean, power to her. Good Lord. So tennis, golf, singing career, been in films, political career, <laughs> and and she's still going. There's still more. Oh wow! In 1987, at the age of 60, she attempted a golf comeback. She wanted to achieve the goal of becoming the oldest active tour player, but was unable to regain her tour card. In a second memoir, "So Much Life to Live For," she articulated her disappointment, including unfulfilled aspirations the porpoisy of endorsements and other professional opportunities, and the many obstacles of all sorts that were thrown in her path over the years. In the late 1980s, 
Althea suffered two cerebral hemorrhages, and in 1992 a stroke. Ongoing medical expenses depleted her financial resources, leaving her unable to afford her rent or medical treatment. Although she reached out to multiple tennis organisations requesting help, none responded to her. Her former doubles partner, Angela Buxton, made her plight known to the tennis community and raised nearly $1 million in donations from around the world to help her. In 1991, Althea became the first woman to receive the Theodore Roosevelt Award, the highest honour from the National Collegiate Athletic Association. She was cited for, quote, symbolising the best qualities of competitive excellence and good sportsmanship, and for her significant contributions to expanding opportunities for women and minorities through sport. Sports Illustrated for Women named her to its list of 100 greatest athletes. In early 2003, Althea survived a heart attack, but died on September 28, 2003, at the age of 76, from complications following respiratory and bladder infections. Uh, I mean, it was a good innings, and she did a lot. <laughs> so, mm. Fellow women's tennis pioneer Billie Jean King praised Althea Gibson's role in breaking barriers, saying, If it hadn't been for Althea Gibson, it wouldn't have been so easy for Arthur Ashe or the ones who followed. On opening night of the 2007 US Open, the 50th anniversary of her first victory at the US National Championships in 1957, Althea was inducted into the US Open Court of Champions. USTA President Alan Schwartz said at the ceremony, It was the quiet dignity which, with which Althea carried herself during the turbulent days of the 1950s that was truly remarkable. Her legacy lives on not only in the stadiums of professional tournaments, but also in schools and parks throughout the nation. Every time a black child, or a Hispanic child, or an Islamic child picks up a tennis racket for the first time, Althea touches another life. When she began playing, less than 5% of tennis newcomers were minorities. Today, some 30% are minorities, two-thirds of which are African-American. This is her legacy. Althea's five Wimbledon trophies are on display to the public at the Smithsonian. The Althea Gibson Seniors Tournament is held annually in Croatia under the auspices of the International Tennis Federation. The Althea Gibson Foundation identifies and supports gifted golf and tennis players who live in urban environments. In September 2009, Wilmington, North Carolina named its new community tennis courts facility the Althea Gibson Tennis Complex. In 2012, a bronze statue was dedicated to her memory in Branchbrook Park in Newark. It says, I hope that I have accomplished just one thing, that I have been a credit to tennis and to my country. The inscription underneath reads, By all measures, Althea Gibson certainly attained her goal. Oh, Yeah, so that's Althea Gibson. First of many things. <laughs> first black Wimbledon champion. First black woman on time. Sorry, that, that just sounded super racist. What, first black woman on time? <laughs> I'm not saying they're late. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. It was just it was just the way you said it. Um, like, oh, first, first black woman on time. And it's just any and all of you, of you black linters going, what? <laughs> yeah. uh, on the cover of Time magazine, yeah. But yeah. Listen, she, you know, it's like so many people where it's like, here's an incredible story. You know, you've had me so far talk about like abolitionists and, you know, um, oh, what was the previous one? Paleontologists. Mm -hmm. And now it's like an awesome Teddy's player. And it's just like, where are the films? You Where also are the had uh, Elizabeth Cochran, the, the greatest pilot the world has ever known. Oh my god, see? <laughs> I haven't forgot about her. Who, yeah. who still holds all the records. So many records are still held by her. Yeah. It's like, where where are these people? Why are they not known? Yeah. Where are the documentaries? Where are the films? Where are the books? Or more importantly, why aren't the books promoted? You know, we yeah. see, like, there's all these... Because a lot of my friends have been having children, so automatically I'm now an uncle, which means, <laughs> oh, listen, you know, for all of my kids who, uh, for all my kids, all of my friends who have daughters, I'm pushing this series on them, which is like, here's a baby's guide to nuclear physics. Here's a baby's guide. I'm trying to get them into STEM subjects because we need more women in STEM. So mm. I figured I may as well try and push it and see if one of them accidentally turns out to be like, you know, a cancer scientist or something. Who knows? Um, but... 
you know, in the ones where, you know, it's like, oh, he's a historical figure. He is, you know, blah, 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 blah. I just, you know, you don't hear about these people. And it's a genuine shame, really, because we are getting some biopics. You know, there's the Harriet Tubman one that's um, coming out or it's filming uh, with mm-hmm. Cynthia Erivo. And I'm very happy for that. I'm very excited to go see it because I know nothing about it. And hopefully it will at least give me a very good um, overview of, you know, the subject and everything. But, like, biopics don't just have to be about white men. They really don't. In fact, you're more likely to get, you know, I will go see a biopic that is about people other, and if it's not a white man, you know, the last one I saw was Hidden Figures, you know, and I love that film so much. Or, you know, just, just, uh, okay. It's not really a rant. It's me just basically going, (laughs) please, just make these films. You know, Netflix, they're always commissioning shit. Just, like, get them to do a law style series where there's six episodes and it's like, right, we're going to do a 40 minute episode, which is nowhere near enough, but dear God, we'll try on a key episode in some people you should have known about. And it's like, cool. Here's Althea. Here's, you know, Catherine. Here's Elizabeth Fry. Here's, you know, what's her name? The paleontologist lady whose name I don't remember. Um, uh, Mary Anning. Mary Anning. I kept calling her Mary Shelley in my head just because I thought... They are she's... doing a film about her. Um, nice. A friend of mine lives at Lyme Regis, where she's from, and they were filming there, and uh, Kate Winslet is playing her. Ah, oh, okay, okay. Fair enough, okay. That's... So there, there's a film about her coming, so... Good. Yeah, but you know what I mean. Be... We need Good. Like, more, <laughs> more stories about women, more stories about, you know, people from different ethnic backgrounds, different sexualities, all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, because otherwise they're going to think history was just dominated by white men. And it's not. It's that history was written by straight yeah. white men, not created by them. They tried to dominate. <laughs> they tried. And let's be, you know, they did manage to succeed <laughs> for hundreds of years, off and off at a time. But we're not living in the past and we shouldn't we could acknowledge the past and go do you know what that was good about the past that was kind of shit obviously i'm like not saying you should go slavery that was a bit shit for a few hundred years and just brush it off you know i'll go oh the treatment of native americans sorry and just brush it off of course not but you know we should be looking to giving new stories to people and we should be looking to you know celebrate people in the past who didn't have a chance otherwise you know i if someone if someone ever does and i mean this in my heart because she's one of my favorite people and she's been dead before i was born is ella fitzgerald she is in many ways um a big kind of chunk of my heart and i love Mm. her and if anyone actually ever does a really good biopic i will be there on opening night and i will see it (laughs) four or five times because i can have and will listen to her music and to someone perform as her and to see her life story and do it all over again and i'll do it with hattie mcdaniel i'll do it with you know i'll do it with with anybody you know the most recent biopic i've technically seen was bohemian rhapsody and ooh, mixed feelings about that. But that's for a different podcast. <laughs> this is a history podcast. Yeah, we podcast. won't get into that one. <laughs> I'm going to say, next time I'm on a film review podcast, they'll be like, oh, so what have you been watching? And I'm like, well, I'll tell you what I've watched ages ago, and it's not related at all, but I need to get this off my chest. Bohemian Rhapsody. And then 40 minutes later, they'll go, well, we don't have any time because we didn't get to any of the films this week because Chris just wouldn't shut the fuck up. So It kind of ties into this podcast, though, you know. They try to rewrite history, so... I always always thought you meant that it kind of ties into this. It's a theme that Chris just doesn't shut the fuck up in any... No, no. I'm like, (laughs) it's true. I'm not even... At at this stage of my life, I've just come to accept it, yeah. Uh, But no, I am very happy to know more about about this this pioneer. Yeah. And I haven't looked yet, but hopefully there'll be some interesting books about her. And Well, she's got two autobiographies, so... Yeah, if... if, people want to learn more um go check those out because yeah we you know these podcasts we always just sort of surface level details really there's so much more about all of these people out there sorry as we do this i am literally on amazon (laughs) (laughs) i mean don't get wrong they're horrible garbage fires for not paying any taxes but also free you know really good shipping um (laughs) i just wanted to be somebody although if 
I may have some listeners in Liverpool now because I've handed out some of my cards in Liverpool. Oh, um, yes. If, oh. if you're in Liverpool, go to this really cool bookshop, um, News From Nowhere, because they're the kind of place that would have this book because I walked in there, just browsed the shelves, and I found the Asata Shakur autobiography, which I wanted to get after doing that episode on her. And they have stuff all about queer history and black history and different minority groups and it's amazing so if you picked up this podcast from them go in there and i'm sure they'll have books on alfia yeah i mean on amazon at the moment and obviously there are other retailers available but let's just uh there's one that looks really good called nothing but trouble the story of althea gibson uh that was in 2011 and it's only two pound 81 at the moment so that's pretty mm. good i know and then there's one that is Seems to be a massive paperback, but it's called Game Changers, the Unsung Heroines of Sports History. I'm not into Ooh. sports. I would read that. But unfortunately, yeah. it's 19 quid, and I can't just buy that. Yeah. <laughs> Will I spend yeah, 19 quid on books? Yes. Not on one book, though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then there's... There don't seem to be any, like, like proper printings of I Always Wanted to Be Somebody, but mm. that's on... Uh, you can definitely find them on, like, eBay. So... Um, but yeah, I am, will be interested to check this woman out and do a little bit of research on my own. Cool. Um, yeah, I think that kind of wraps up Althea there. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've listened to my latest episode, Chris. There's a, a new segment we do here at the end now. Oh, um, um, I, feel, I feel really bad, but no, I haven't. No, no, it's fine. As, um, it's basically, I want to talk about a, a group online uh, called Planet Change 10. Uh, plan it change 10 and it's about a really big important terrifying subject which is the fact that we're, we're gonna all be dead because we're destroying the planet um it's about climate change and the effects it's having and it needs to be looked at because scientists have said we've got 10 years to change everything about the way humanity lives or we're gonna die mm. And it's it's not a debate. You can't turn around and say climate change doesn't exist. It does. Uh, we're seeing the evidence. You know, we've got snow in Hawaii and summer temperatures here in the UK in February and the oceans are changing colour. It's happening. You, you can't bury your head in the sand and pretend it isn't. But if it is big and it is scary, because it is, and you don't know what to do, go to Planet Change 10. Um it's a group whose the idea is to get people together in their communities and form groups uh, which can meet in person or online and, and help each other and support each other through it. Um, they want to get people to discuss their fears and to get artists and, and other creators to put their fears and worries into use online and the real world to try and have an impact on people and spread the message. Um, studies show that people shut down when they learn about climate change because it of how awful it is but if we get together as a community discuss our fears it can help motivate us to go forward and do something like those kids are doing walking out of schools to protest and and bombarding politicians because that's what we need to do but you can't do it on your own so go to planet change 10 check it out it's an amazing group it's founded by dave anthony the uh, american comedian who started the dollop podcast which has been a big inspiration for us here and who we're big fans of so go go have a look at that they've just recently done a live video of their first group meeting that's on their instagram and facebook um and their twitter it's, it's at planet change 10 so go give them a look and yeah we we need to do something so yeah that's our little push for that this episode cool sounds good so now to the regular wrap-up that you're used to now that i've thrown <laughs> you off uh rhythm a bit there um where would you like to direct people if they enjoyed this episode and our banter and our long tangents and they want to experience more of Chris Haig? <laughs> Sorry, it just made me sound like if you want to enjoy more of Chris Haig, the experience. <laughs> oh, oh that's God. your autobiography, the Chris Haig experience. No, no. <laughs> no, I can't. No, I can't. No, it's just bad. Um, Sorry, I've got, yes. I've got the opening theme for your biopic already recorded oh, and, no. and released, haven't I? So, oh. <laughs> listen, you and I are just getting over that. <laughs> you, 
it's a thing, dear listeners, in case you don't know, that Amy turned it turned like a bunch of my swearing into a rap. Which I'm annoyed at because I can occasionally spit some okay bars when I'm in the right mood. But I'm like I I just yeah. Anyway, you can find me on Twitter at higher underscore boy. Um generally I'm just talking about absolute nonsense and usually reacting to something that's going on in pop culture that I'm having a really fun time with or just talking to people and just having fun. So please feel free, send a message, say hi. Um, Yeah, if you see me react to something, feel free to kind of go, what do you think about this, that sort of thing. Um, Apart from appearing, I'm basically like an associate producer basically now on Eccentric Earth and Amy will admit it for all she puts me through. (laughs) Um, so I co-host a couple of different podcasts, the first of which is Good Evening and Alfred Hitchcock Podcast, and that is me and two of my Canadian uh, best mates, Tom Caldwell and Brandon Shea Mutala, um, both Canadian, so it's a nice little transatlantic experience, and we are covering the films and works of Alfred Hitchcock uh, chronologically with some nice little details into like Bates Motel and other kind of uh, bits and pieces um so definitely check us out there we are on various streaming networks but mainly we are on spotify and itunes and i think also maybe google play now but just give us a try um it's a lot of fun we've moved past the talkies and we're now into the actual like the good films um second podcast that i co-host is uh, north by nerdwest that is me and my best mate emma platt and we have a lot of fun uh, we've managed o- over two years. We've managed to be super productive and get twelve episodes out. Which, if you know us, oh yeah, oh I know, I know. Scoff all you want, Amy. Scoff all you want, but <laughs> it's worth pointing out that over the two years, Emma and I have both co- done and completed masters. Emma has a child, you know. So it was just like, yeah, it's amazing. We got twelve out, to be honest. <laughs> um so we are on soundcloud we are on uh itunes uh we are planning on getting some more episodes out this summer and just now that we're just trying to like get all our ducks in a row and everything um and we talk about kind of pretty much everything anything mainly kind of nerdy stuff um kind of pop culture we've discussed kind of like misogyny in doctor who or kind of um we we devoted an entire episode to uh, Dwayne the Rock Johnson. Um, <laughs> it, it's mad, basically. It's very mad, and there's like drag race and all kinds of random pop culture shit thrown in. Um, and if you enjoy those twelve, please let us know, and that will hopefully spur us on to actually <laughs> get the others done um, for your enjoyment. Apart from that, I pop up on other episodes of stuff. Apart from Eccentric Earth, I also appear on Smogersboard on a regular basis. I have just oh my god what have i just done i've just done an episode of uh matt latham's pick a disc which is going to be a lot of fun and hopefully he'll have me on for more of them and then yeah just other, just other bits and shits you guys just other bits and shits awesome yeah i like i like how your release schedule is like you're the the sherlock of podcasts you you come out very rarely but it's worth it when you do. <laughs> oh, I mean that depends on whether you think Sherlock's any good. Or not. Yeah, <laughs> it's, like, it's like oh, maybe you know. I don't, I don't know. I'm trying to think of like another like oh, it gets released sporadically, but it's pretty good. And I'm like uh. The I don't know. I'll come up with an analogy <laughs> next time. Um, but no, yeah, we managed to get a few episodes out in 2017, uh, a few more in 2018, and we basically took. We are technically still on a break, but we're just going to try and get some more in um, as soon as. Um, just what? Just while we try and recalibrate, because life has been uh, pretty mad over the past kind of like 18 months. So it's all good though. Awesome. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> well, if you enjoyed the show if this is your first time listening and you want to find us online you can find us on twitter and instagram at eccentric underscore earth uh we're on facebook which is www.facebook.com forward slash eccentric earth uh our website is www.eccentricearthpodcast.com uh we're on all major podcast providers and youtube so if you find us there make sure you click subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes if you want to get in contact with us for any feedback to say how good chris's rambles are or if you want less of them our email address is eccentric earth at outlook.com be kind because amy <laughs> will tell me oh i will she, wa- she wants my feelings she'll go listen 
someone <laughs> thinks that you ramble too much and think you're a dickhead, and I'm like, ah, my depression was true. <laughs> oh, God. And if you want to follow me online as well, I'm on Instagram and Twitter, which is at amazing underscore Amy underscore W. Um, I do some writing online for the pop culture website, Set the Tape, mostly book reviews and comic reviews. Oh, but fuck. A... Sorry, so do I. Yeah, no, I forgot. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Not as, not as much as you do. You're a machine and I can't believe how you do it. I've, yes, I've yeah. dropped down quite a bit now. I, I used to do a lot of TV and film stuff and I've reined that in just because I have no goddamn time anymore. But I, I still do the books and comics, but the yeah. odd article on various things um but it's outside of my work it's a great website so go and check that out um and if you want to hear me podcast with something a little different it's either going to be the next one or the one after when this comes out i guesting on back to the 80s um where i'm talking about the sylvester stallone rutger hauer and billy d williams film nighthawks which it seems like no one's ever heard of so if you like 80s pop culture go give them a listen and you'll catch me on there too well, I think that about wraps up everything here, unless there's something else you want to plug that you forgot. <laughs> How dare you? Um, <laughs> I don't... I I don't... It's late, listeners. We'll let them off. I was going to say, it's late, <laughs> and I've had, a very, I've had a very long day, and nothing's gone right at work. And, I, and, and this is not fun. I didn't tell Amy this before we started, but I had a full-on panic attack. Not like a real panic attack. I'm not glamorizing them, and I've had them. But no, I left my phone at home, and I immediately thought, fuck, I've left it on the bus. So yeah, it's not. It's, today did not start off great for me. <laughs> And, and, I'm, and I've I'm just t- tormented you for the past hour. I'm oh, so listen, sorry. Oh, listen. No, 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 no. Compared to everything else, this is fine. But, like, Amy's basically my sister at this stage. So I'm just like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> You'd be like, oh, is there anything else you want to promote? And I'm like, well, there probably is. But I'm too goddamn tired. <laughs> see, uh, if, see if I ever come in here again. Of course oh, I will. Oh, you'll be back. Of course I will. <laughs> Of course I will. Like an abused child, I will always come back for more. And that isn't me making fun of abuse. That is a Carrie Fisher <laughs> quote when she roasted George Lucas. It is very funny. It's on YouTube. Look it up. <sighs> I missed the bit about the metal bikini out because I thought it's just too weird an image if anyone's ever seen me in real life to imagine me in a metal <laughs> bikini. Because they'd be like, Jesus, how much goes into it? <laughs> Sorry, tangent, tangent. I'm so tired. <laughs> well, we've ended as we started with a tangent, so I think that's the best place to say goodbye, everyone, and thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs>